I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. Crisis at the border. New developments in how the Biden administration is addressing an influx of migrants. We have a report and reaction. Newest senator. A closer look at Democrat LaFonza Butler and her close ties to the abortion industry. Finding a way. An update on Sudan as the United Nations struggles to support the war-torn country. And to walk in their shoes. The mayor of New York City goes on an international pilgrimage starting with a Marian shrine. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Faustina. Our top story tonight, faced with a surge of migrants who are overwhelming state and federal resources, President Joe Biden decided to go against his own policies. He just reversed course and agreed to extend the southern border wall. Ad reaction is pouring in tonight. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, in making his controversial decision, President Joe Biden told reporters today that basically his hands were tied for legal reasons. That's how the money has to be spent. But the criticism has been quick and fierce. The Biden administration approves 20 more miles of barriers between Texas and Mexico, following a record number of border crossings. Republicans using the president's own words when he said, there will not be another foot of wall constructed in my administration to highlight his flip-flop on policy. And the former head of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, blasted previous attacks on Republicans, writing, the hypocrisy of this administration is truly stunning. Just three years ago, building the wall was racist and foolish. But today, President Joe Biden told reporters he really had no choice. The border wall, the money was appropriated for the border wall. I tried to get them to reappropriate, to redirect that money. They didn't. They wouldn't. And in the meantime, there's nothing under the law other than they have to use the money for what it was appropriate. I can't stop that. Do you believe the border wall works? No. The border wall extension also upsets environmental groups because President Biden is rushing construction by waiving 26 federal laws. An advocate with the Center for Biological Diversity says the government is casting aside protections for endangered species, clean water, indigenous graves, and more. Still, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas calls the border barrier an immediate need. He is one of the president's cabinet members meeting this week with her Mexican counterparts. Meanwhile, Ukraine, a Russian rocket strike hitting a village store, dozens dead, emergency crews searching the smoldering rubble of damaged buildings. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky meeting with European leaders in Spain seeking more support from allies calls the strike a completely deliberate act of terrorism. And at the White House, President Biden, who will soon give a speech on continued funding for Ukraine, which he says is critical, meets with his national security team. Now back to the border wall extension decision by the Biden administration. Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador called constructing a wall a setback adding it does not solve the problem. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, mayors from two major U.S. cities are sounding the alarm about the immigration crisis. Both New York and Chicago are struggling to deal with the hundreds of thousands of migrants who have arrived over the last year. And today, New York City Mayor Eric Adams is in Mexico trying to discourage asylum seekers from crossing the border. We want to make sure that we have a great level of transparency of the challenges that we are facing so that people can manage their expectations. This is the first stop on Adams' four-day tour of Latin America. Meanwhile, Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson is also planning a trip to the southern border. He said the city could be seeing up to 22 busloads of migrants arriving daily from Texas. And joining us now is Rodney Scott, Distinguished Fellow for Border Security with the Texas Public Policy Foundation and former Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. Rodney, great to see you as always. A, a lot to touch on today. But let's start off with the mayors of New York City and Chicago traveling south of the border to address the migrant crisis as it's hitting both of the sanctuary cities hard. Your thoughts and what do you think will come from these visits? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think anything is going to come from these visits. They're going, it's a good political stunt for them. Uh, but both of those cities are sanctuary cities. They promise people protection and care once they get here. And they've made a commitment to not work with federal immigration authorities. Um, that is a draw between that and getting released at the border. Uh, you're going to continue to see this flow. There's no consequences currently for illegal immigration. I'm glad to see that they're speaking out, but they need to take actual actions 
Uh, and just going down to Mexico and trying to tell people to not come get free stuff isn't going to work it. Yeah, apparently uh, the strain of, you know, housing all the migrants seems to really be overwhelming the city of New York so much uh, that the mayor is looking to get rid of the right to shelter mandate that's been in place for decades. I mean, this is really quite the about face from Mayor Adams, who not too long ago basically said it was New York's responsibility to house folks and provide services for them. Let's talk about that and what it signals. I think it signals that reality is starting to sink in. It's easy and nice to say some of these things. Emotionally, it feels good. We do want to take care of people and help people in need. But unfortunately, there's too many people that will exploit the system and take advantage of it. And we've had the U.S. Border Patrol has caught almost 2.9 million people coming across the southwest border this year. Uh, since the Biden administration took over, there's been over 1.6 million gotaways. And those people are coming over here and somebody's going to have to take care of them. They do not stay at the border. Uh, New York has seen a very, very small fraction of that. And they're, and they're, they're seeing the repercussions of their prior decisions of being a sanctuary city and these, these right to shelter laws and some of these other things that weren't really well thought out. Yeah, meantime, as mentioned, the Biden administration is also reversing course now and building uh, border walls in the Rio Grande Valley. This, as President Biden said today, that, you know, if he doesn't think border walls work, Ronnie, help us unpack this one. Yeah, so first and foremost, I hope they actually do build wall. Border walls do work. Uh, I, in my entire career, we experimented with different things, and they're a great return on investment for the taxpayer. In San Diego, a 12-mile section of border wall freed up 150 agents a day to go do other enforcement duties. That was a $28 million return on the investment. But now we've got a big conflict between the White House and the Secretary. You know, they're claiming, and this is partially true, that it was 2019 appropriations, and by law, the, the Empowerment Control Act requires the executive branch to spend that money consistent with the intent, which was to build a border wall. But it doesn't force them to waive environmentals and to put in writing with the Secretary's signature that this border crisis has gotten to the point that he needs an immediate barrier. Uh, again, I think we're just seeing the confusion and the conflict between, you know, emotional utopian kind of mindset and the facts on the ground at the border. They're, they're colliding in this administration. Um, I hope they do build the wall, but I think this was a move uh, to basically just buy more time. I don't think they're going to build a meaningful border wall system that we designed. Oh, Rodney, we have about a minute or so left, but I do want to get to this. It's not just people coming over the border in record numbers. Uh, according to Customs and Border Patrol, more than 25,500 pounds of fentanyl were seized just from the beginning of this year to August. That's compared to nearly 13,000 pounds of the deadly drug the year before. Rodney, that is almost double and very scary. Your thoughts? So actually, thank you for bringing that up, because even I get caught up in this. We start talking about the border is simple immigration, and that's not it. The cartels control everything that crosses that southwest border. They use these large numbers of illegal immigrants, the migrants, to overwhelm law enforcement, meaning get them all busy and distracted, to bring in whatever else they want in the second wave. And that includes narcotics, criminals, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, you name it, even terrorists. That's the real threat. We need to actually control the border so we can make decisions who and what comes into this country. Fentanyl is pouring across killing people uh, daily in this nation, and we can stop that, make a significant impact if we would just secure the borders and make sure we made decisions about what comes into the country instead of allowing the Mexican cartels to make those decisions. Oh, Ronnie, thank you so much for weighing in. Always great to have you on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, with no U.S. House Speaker, the death of Senator Dianne Feinstein and Congress needing to pass nearly a dozen spending bills before the government runs out of money, it is unlikely that Congress will pass any more Ukraine aid anytime soon. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales takes a closer look and joins us now with the latest. Eric. Good evening, Tracy. Yes, it's hard to believe right now Congress remains in recess with no House Speaker as lawmakers attend the funeral of the late Senator Dianne Feinstein out in California. As we know, lawmakers stripped out nearly $6 billion in funding for Ukraine's war effort, all in an effort to pass the latest 45-day continuing resolution. But Pentagon officials say that the clock is ticking and U.S. funds to help the Ukrainians win on the battlefield is running out. We have enough funding authorities to meet Ukraine's battlefield needs for just a little bit longer, but we need Congress to act to ensure there is no disruption in our support. Pentagon officials say existing funds are dwindling, slowing down the U.S. resupply of some of its own forces. Senator Lindsey Graham and others tell me pulling out now would be a foreign policy disaster. 
pulling the plug on Ukraine and letting Putin get away with this invasion uh, will destabilize the world more than Afghanistan. So after having been to Ukraine, you can see how the Ukrainian military has used to great effect the assistance we provided. Authoritarian leaders around the world are watching closely uh, to what happens uh, in Ukraine. And so, you know, if, if the American people were to give up on the people of Ukraine, that would send a terrible message uh, around the world. We've already seen what the brave Ukrainians fighting for their freedom can do with our help. They've repelled Russia's brazen aggression and shown that they can win this war. We just can't afford to let up supporting them now. The U.S. has already given more than $110 billion, and some say no more, especially with the U.S. debt at $33 trillion and growing. No funding for Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, funding a, a war that's continuing to murder people, uh, funding a war that's defending another country's border but not our own border, uh, that's absolutely my red line. We cannot continue to put the needs of other countries above our own. We cannot save Ukraine by dooming the U.S. economy. And we certainly cannot save Ukraine by fighting a war with Russia. Others say accountability of the current aid must happen. There's got to be accountability for how that money is spent. It's got to be spent in a way which, which is not stolen, which is wisely used, which fulfills the mission of the Ukrainian military. It is important to note that Congressman Jim Jordan, one of the two so far who wants to be the next Speaker of the House, said that he, would, he wouldn't bring a Ukraine funding bill to the floor until Congress addresses the southern border crisis. So House Republicans could use this Ukraine funding as leverage, forcing the Senate to vote for more stricter border security measures. We also want to let you know that EWTN News Nightly has just been informed that former President Donald Trump may actually be making an appearance up here on Capitol Hill next week as somehow House lawmakers may nominate him as the next Speaker of the House. We have to wait and see. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the United Nations says that it is facing dangerous and significant challenges trying to bring aid into war-torn Sudan. 19 aid workers have been killed and 29 injured. It is unacceptable and it is unlawful. We also need to see an end to interference from the conflict parties in our operations. Well, the Northeast African nation has been in chaos after military factions began fighting in April. Since then, at least 5,000 people have been killed. More than 12,000 others have been wounded. Aid workers say that the true numbers are likely even higher. The Israeli army has released footage of an overnight raid conducted in the occupied West Bank. Israel says that it arrested 10 suspects throughout the night. Two Palestinian militants were also killed by Israeli gunfire. This is just the latest event in what has been a cycle of violence in the territory for more than 18 months. Sad. We have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including religion in America, a new study on the role of faith in daily U.S. life. And a closer look at California's newest senator and her pro-abortion background. A new study says that here in the United States, those who don't follow an organized religion still believe in God. According to the Associated Press NORC poll, 30% of Americans do not identify with a religion. But of that group called nuns, 43% believe in God or a higher power. And 79% of nuns say that some things just can't be explained by science or natural causes. Well, there is a new member of the U.S. Senate and pro-lifers are taking a closer look at the replacement for the late Dianne Feinstein. Alfonso Butler was appointed by California Democrat Governor Gavin Newsom. She was previously the president of EMILY's List, a group that seeks to elect pro-abortion women into office. Senator Butler has expressed support for a measure that would codify Roe v. Wade and expand abortions in the United States. We go now to Mary Margaret Olihan, senior reporter for The Daily Signal, who has been taking a closer look at the newest U.S. Senator. Mary Margaret, always great to be with you. Uh, first off, your reaction uh, when you saw that LaFonza Butler was the handpicked successor for Senator Dianne Feinstein. What did you think? 
Well, I wasn't surprised at all. Of course, LaFonza Butler is the president of EMILY's List, which is one of the most, I would say, one of the most high-profile pro-abortion organizations in the country. Uh, we probably think of Planned Parenthood when we think of organizations like that, but EMILY's List is right up there with them. They help elect high-profile pro-abortion women to office in order to enact more what they call um, legislation protecting reproductive rights, in other words, promoting abortion across the country. So she has worked for Kamala Harris. She's worked for Hillary Clinton on both of their failed presidential campaigns. Uh, she's also a former labor union boss. She's just your typical Democratic activist who also got promoted through the ranks to become the president of one of the top pro-abortion groups in the country, and now she will be a California senator. Mary Margaret, I mean, what are pro-lifers saying about this? Well, pro-lifers are not happy, of course. They know that she will be pushing some of the most radical pro-abortion agendas. As we've seen with many other Democrats in the Senate, in the House, in the White House, there are no limits to what they want when it comes to abortion or, as they call it, reproductive rights. So we have not seen any Democrats as of late actually specify if they would support a single restriction on abortion or, as we would say, a protection for the unborn. Uh, none of them will specify that, even when you ask them, leaving everyone to just understand the implication that Democrats support abortion without limits and on demand. And it appears that she is along the same lines. What do you think her being in the Senate now, what do you think that will mean for the fight for the unborn? Well, I think it'll mean that it's, it's even more of an uphill battle than ever before. You know, this is just another pro-abortion senator who appears to have the backing of pretty much every solid Democrat pro-abortion group out there, including Gavin Newsom, who I think is particularly interesting that Gavin Newsom selected her at this point in time. Um, Emily's List is well known for supporting people at pivotal stages. If you look back when D.C. was dealing with the five babies that were found here um, that were from an abortion clinic and we were wondering whether they were illegally aborted, Emily's List came out and endorsed Mayor Bowser right during that time period, D.C. Mayor Bowser, uh, when she was coming under fire from pro-lifers. So they, they, they weigh in at significant times. So I think Newsom's Newsom putting her in this position might say a little more about what he's looking for in the next couple years or so as well. I want to switch gears here and talk about something else. Earlier this week, a court in Wisconsin ruled in favor of two sets of parents uh, who had filed a lawsuit after accusing a school district of adopting a policy to allow and affirm a minor student's request to transition to a different gender identity. Uh, the parents say this was done without their consent and even over their objections. What more can you tell us about this? Yeah, so this was a really disturbing case in which these parents were saying that the school was socially affirming their child against their wishes. And what that means is the school was socially encouraging this child to believe that she was a boy. And uh, social affirmations can include using someone's preferred pronoun. So in this case, they're calling that girl a he or a him or using the name that she asked them to use. Um, in other words, going around the parents' wishes outside of the home to push this child along to a gender transition. And as we know, Tracy, these are such dangerous practices when it comes to young minds. Um, the Internet nowadays has made it so dangerous for young people when they begin searching, I don't feel like I'm in the right body. Should I? Am I transgender? So many people out there are willing to tell them, yes, you should be going on this website that can help you get hormones secretly that your parents won't know about. So many different dangerous pitfalls for young people in this day and age. And so thankfully, in this case, the court ruled or the judge ruled that this school district should not be socially affirming children against their parents' consent. So it's a huge victory for parents. All right. Sounds good, Mary Margaret. Always great to be with you. Thank you so much. Thanks. God bless. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, speaking out, an American cardinal clarifies his questions to Pope Francis. Plus, the mayor of New York City makes an important stop on his visit to Mexico. Raymond Burke says the questions or dubia he and four other cardinals submitted to the Holy Father were not meant as an attack. In remarks at a news conference earlier this week, Cardinal Burke says the questions were aimed at safeguarding church doctrine and in no way were meant to undermine the Pope nor his agenda. The American Cardinal also said other church leaders supported the questions to the Vatican, though they did not officially add their names. As we reported yesterday, Pope Francis has published an update 
to his 2015 papal letter on caring for the planet. The new document is the second part of Laudato Si. It warns of grave consequences if humanity continues to ignore threats to the planet. The Holy Father says that we are close to the breaking point. EWTN Vatican News correspondent Colin Flynn has more. Good evening, Tracy. The world in which we live is collapsing and may be nearing the breaking point. That was from Pope Francis, issuing a stark warning about climate change. It came from a letter entitled in Latin, Laudate Deo, meaning praise God. And in it, the Pope stresses, quote, grave consequences if humanity continues to ignore the threat of climate change. This is an update to the encyclical he released eight years ago called Laudato Si, which was about the environment and our responsibility towards it. And in this new, much shorter companion reflection, the Pope says that, quote, our responses have not been adequate to address ongoing ecological concerns. He said climate change is one of the principal challenges facing society and the global community, adding that its effects are felt by the most vulnerable people in the world and that this was no longer an ideological issue. He talked about increasing heat waves, polar ice caps melting, saying that it was going to lead again to grave consequences for everyone. He also seemed to take target at those who questioned the science and agendas behind some of the climate change movements, writing, quote, it is no longer possible to doubt the human origin of climate change, saying that those who did not take action were, quote, irresponsible. The Pope reminds the Catholic faithful to remember the beauty and importance of God's creation, referencing the Old Testament and the Bible, and that, quote, God has united us to all his creatures. He adds at the end the stark warning again that if we lose touch with God's creation or even claim that we can replace God, there would be catastrophic consequences. That's what Pope Francis said. He also took square aim at the United States, noting that per capita emissions in America, they're twice as high as China and seven times greater than the average in poorer countries. This release of the letter from Pope Francis comes just one month before the next round of UN climate talks in Dubai. In Rome, Colm Flynn for EWTN News Nightly. And finally tonight, as mentioned, the mayor of New York City is on an international pilgrimage starting with the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I wanted to do the same. I wanted to come here and pray. Mayor Eric Adams first stopped in Mexico City at the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, as most migrants do before starting their journey to the United States. Now, during his time there, he posted on X, quote, the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe means so much to so many people around the globe, especially in New York City. I felt the power of faith and service it inspires firsthand. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.